Welcome to the CEN Show, a platform where you learn from the world community. This evening, our guest is Dr. Charles Alexander. And before we get started, I want to talk about the Level Set Show. And then let me introduce myself. I'm Roski Mascani. And then we have Brother Machinda on the line. And we're supposed to have a, a few other brothers coming on to, to join us. But I want to, so here we got, we got Brother Green. It's Brother Stabon Green. Okay. We have another brother that's coming on. And I want to introduce him. Go ahead, Dr. Charles. Introduce us to uh, Brother Green. And so we have, uh, I, I'm a Prince Hall Mason, and we have one of my good good brothers of the craft, Brother uh, Stephon Green, who's actually, he's, he's, he's from Cali. He's from the West Coast, but uh, he now resides in St. Louis and um he and I, we, we spend a lot of time in conversation about the black community. And um, and he he watches both this show, the recordings of this show, as well as uh, recordings of the level ship, uh, the level set. And and then in addition to those things, you know, we just share information back and forth about, you know, how we enhance the community. Okay. Well, welcome, Brother Green. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. So I want to talk about the Level Set Show that uh, Dr. Charles Alexander, we have Dr. Gerald, well, his uh, attorney, Gerald, mm -hmm. Gerald Christmas, and uh, attorney Larry Fields. I think it's one of the, one of the best podcasts that I really like the podcast. And it's excellent information. We have uh, brothers from Morehouse. You know, you you from Morehouse, correct, Dr. Charles Alexander? I'm from Morehouse, and uh, Attorney Fields is from Morehouse. Attorney Christmas went to uh, Central Missouri State, but he got his law degree from South, um, from Texas Southern. Texas and Southern. then we also have on the show uh, Mike Jones. We call him the Mike Jones. He's okay. He's okay. our sage and our and our wise elder, and uh, he's a graduate of the University of Missouri. Oh, here come Brother Larry Fields and a couple of other people coming on to it. Brother Hembrick is coming on. I want to formally meet Brother Larry Fields. What's going on, brother? How you doing, Brother Larry Fields, Attorney Larry oh. Fields? Oh, I'm well, man. How are you all? I'm good, man. I just I enjoy what you guys do with the level set, man. It's it's an excellent show, man. I just appreciate everything that you guys are doing, man. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, the feeling is mutual. We appreciate uh, you and uh, what you all are doing, man. So anything we can do to help, it's uh, you know it's it's all the same page. So if there's anything we can ever do uh, to help you expand what you're doing. We're excited to do so. And we certainly appreciate um, your encouragement and support. Well, man, I, I really enjoy the the, uh, the level of, of intelligence, the level of, it's just, it's just, man, I, I, I don't even know what to say. It's just really good. <laughs> so Thank I you. Wanna, uh, I, I want to thank you guys for allowing us to put it on our channel. You know, the more people see this the, and listen to this commentary, the, I, I think we, we're we headed in the right direction. So let me just share with everybody. The Level Set Show is it's all also featured here on the Community Education Network channel. And so I'm going to show everybody the, the shows we have on there. So we have one right here. It's uh, Me the Money. Then we have, let me see, where's another one as I scroll down? We have uh, one right here with uh, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, letter from Atlanta Penitentiary. And all of these shows are excellent. Then we have another one right here with uh, Professor Carter G. Woodson. 
Here's another one, the, the color convention shows. We have at least, I don't know how many we have on here, but all of these shows are excellent. And I encourage anybody that hears this to check these shows out. And then uh, Attorney Larry Fields, can you tell us wh where else they, uh, people can access your show? Yes, we um, also have a YouTube channel. It is uh, the, the Level Set uh, on YouTube. Okay. So there's another, another uh, place to access the show in, in its original home. <laughs> We're just we're just extending it. That's all. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We also have joined here. Uh, Brother Hembrick is here, so that's one of our our uh, members that's from Conscious Corner with Professor Amin Ra. So now, Dr. Charles Alexander, we want to get started here, and please tell us your title of the topic this evening, and then you can go ahead and start. Thank you, brother. Uh, good evening, family. Good evening, community. Um, as we, as black as uh, Black History Month comes to a close, um, I wanted to do something. You know, brother Rye and I had this conversation um, a couple of months ago about me presenting this month. And uh, I, I was I was working on a different topic, but uh, actually, as <laughs> this kind of comes out of some of our conversations on the level set, to be perfectly honest, that you know we've been spending a lot of time going back and forth <clears throat> with Carter G. and with Frederick Douglass, and so you know, again, just to, to make sure everybody's on the same page, the 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 reason the Black History Month is celebrated in February is because Carter G wanted to recognize uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And so that's how he chose February 7th to February 14th. And, um, and so I was thinking about Frederick Douglass and, um, and, I, and I was just revisiting a narrative of the life of, Fe of Frederick Douglass and uh, as, as our regulars know, I'm a clinical psychologist. And uh, whenever I think about the, the narratives and, and you, know, you know, well, when I think about the history and I think about the lives of the enslaved Africans, and then once I kind of delve into the, the narratives, they always move me in a certain kind of way. But one of the things that I hadn't really done in, until this month I started to think about the life of Frederick Douglass um, from the point from the point of view of adverse childhood experiences, and so that's what I want to talk about today. So the so what we're going to talk about today is, you know, instead of the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, we're going to do a narrative of the trauma of Frederick Douglass. And we're gonna frame that within the context of adverse childhood experiences. And so brother, can I share my screen? Is that? And so, So just to kind of kick it off, you know, I'm going to craft, this is going to be our framework. This is what I want you to be thinking about. Um, can you all see the screen? Yes. Ross, can you see? It? Yes. Okay. And so <laughs> I, I want folks to be thinking about adverse childhood experiences uh, as we read various excerpts in the life of uh, Frederick Douglass, and um, and you know, and we'll pause here and there to to get some reflections. But adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood, birth to seventeen, 
after experiencing violence, abuse, or neglect, witnessing violence in the home or community, having a family member attempt or die by suicide, also included are aspects of the child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding, such as growing up in a household with substance use problems, mental health problems, instability due to parental separation or household members being in jail or prison. Please note the examples above are not a complete list of adverse experiences. Many other traumatic experiences could impact them. <laughs> such as not having enough food to eat, experiencing homelessness or unstable housing or experiencing discrimination. ACEs are linked to chronic health problems, mental illness and substance use problems in adolescence and adulthood. ACEs can also negatively impact education, job opportunities and earning potential. All right, so just be thinking about that, but as, as you contemplate those things, like before we even dive into the literature, like how many aces are people conceptualizing when they think of the life of Frederick Douglass? Just, so just knowing what we call aces now and, and considering what you already know about Frederick Douglass, you know, let's, let's get a quick tally about what we think are some of the aces for Frederick Douglass. So I'll kick it off. For one, he's born in slavery as an ace. What else do we know? I'm looking at those three bullets and I could, I could say that I wouldn't know, but I would guess that the first two, experiencing violence, abuse, and or neglect, witnessing, witnessing violence in the home or community, I know those two for, for sure. We know that for sure, right? But I can't say about the third one, but I'm quite sure he, he probably seen something like that happen. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So he's born enslaved. He's witnessing. He, he lives on a plantation. So that is his community. He's witnessing community violence. Right. He himself is uh, he himself is a victim of violence and abuse and neglect. OK, so so this is baseline. All right. And so. I just want us to kind of think about these kind of things, um, not just when we think about the life of Frederick Douglass, but when we think about the lives of, you know, of the ancestors, of those who came before us. And we don't really, we don't want to stop thinking about it uh, just, you know, once we get beyond, um, you know, once, once, the, once we get beyond the Civil War and we want to think about it during Reconstruction. We want to think about it during the Nadir. We want to think about it during Jim Crow. And we want to think about it now because these things exist. But oftentimes we're vulnerable because like, like we're, we're kind of time bound to an extent. And so these things that come to us now because of this is kind of where the mental health science is we don't always go back to where we know these things actually come from. And, um, and one of the other things that kind of has really drawn me to Frederick Douglass in this context is that we have, we, and not just, not just black folks, but in the community at large, you know, we are experiencing this thing, um, you know, that, we, we lack health literacy and we lack, we lack mental health literacy. And so what do we mean? We mean we don't know, we're not always able um, to tie, to, to give word, to give language, to express and explain 
what we're thinking and what we're feeling. Um, and, then, and then beyond that, uh, in the mental health space, we don't always know how, when, and where to get services. And so all of those things are functions of, of mental health literacy. And so like quickly in, in terms of uh, access to care. So I'm a psychologist and um, although if I wanted, you know, I, I could if I wanted to prescribe medication, but I don't. Um, but all psychologists don't prescribe medication. Psychiatrists prescribe medication. And so oftentimes people don't know the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And so um, whether they want medication or not, they don't know the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And so we have people laboring for months waiting to see a psychiatrist because they need counseling when they could have come to a psychologist or a social worker or a counselor. But that's one of those just very basic, basic pieces about, you know, the, the literacy. And then the other basic piece, of course, is to be able to um, really explain the phenomenon that you're experiencing. And, you know, when we read these expert, these excerpts from Frederick Douglass, we're going to see that, you know, in 1841, his brother didn't have a problem with describing what he experienced uh, literally from birth to, you know, age 20. And because uh, pretty much that's what that first book captures. That first book captures zero to 20, maybe a little older than 20, but it captures his life enslaved on through his escape. Uh, any questions or any comments, brothers, before we, we jump into the actual narrative? Okay, do uh, please raise your hand if you have a question or a comment at this point, so I can come to you. Okay, nothing so far. All right. We're not going to read all of the stuff, but there are some things that are important for us to some things that are very important for us to know. Here we are on on um, starting at the bottom of. running at the bottom of page nine, carrying over to 10. My mother was named Harriet Bailey. She was the daughter of Isaac and Bessie Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was of darker complexion than either my grandmother or grandfather. My mother, my father was a white man. That's supposed to be showing, Dr. Charles. Can you see that? No, we're still on the aces. Still on the aces? Okay, let me come out and let's see what happens. Because I've switched. I don't know if it... While we're waiting, uh, we also have here this evening, Sister Aziza has joined. We have uh, uh, Sister Linda Shorter is here also. And then we have UMA. Is that, is that Brother Kwabana? Or Dr. Charles? I'm not sure if that's Brother Kwabana. Okay. All right. So now do you have, are you seeing the book now? Yes. All right. Sorry about that. My father was a white man. He was admit, he was admitted to be such by all I ever heard speak of my parentage. The opinion was also whispered that my master 
was my father, but of the correctness, but of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. The means of knowing was withheld from me. The means of knowing was withheld from me. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant before I knew her as my mother. It is a common custom in the part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age, frequently before the child has reached his 12th month. His mother is taken from it and hired out on some form or considerable distance off. And the child is placed under the care of an old woman too old for field labor. But what this separation is done, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection towards his mother and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. So how many aces do we see right here? Another thing that we have to know, aces are cumulative. They're dose dependent. The more aces, the more ill. So what do we see right here? Anybody? You would have to go back to that screen. <laughs> to the aces? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and go if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, first of all, what a brilliant analysis. I see what you're doing. And, you know, that's why you have a um, small circle of friends, Charles. Um, <laughs> you know, you <laughs> I'm, I'm a, well, that's why I'm the only one that likes you. Uh, but no, that analysis is incredible to, to bring aces in, particularly when you're doing things on the West Coast, which was popularized by... Uh, and I'm not saying that she came up with it, but um, uh, their um, their uh, whatever the equivalent of their, their attorney general was, the medical attorney general, popularized that ACES, which I thought was brilliant when she um, did that. Uh, and then for you in Black History Month to juxtapose that against something that should be uh, fairly obvious, but it's not um, against. Uh, a stalwart and an individual that really is a bedrock for our freedom and in spite of everything he had to do is just brilliant. That is, I mean, it, it could be expanded to, you know, a white paper, a book, a series or anything. But when you, since you've made us turn our attention to that, it is excruciating. I'm sitting here with my wife and I asked her when you, you know, just based off of that passage that you just read, which one of our children would have thrived in that environment? And you can imagine, you know, a woman that nursed all four of our children, what her expression was. She never had to utter a word. And just the trauma that uh, he had to endure and, you know, his entire community, our entire community, our ancestors, you know, this week I've almost had the theme of what, you know, has there ever been a better time period for black people to exist in America? Um, what era would I rather go back to, if any? And, <laughs> and, and I can't think of one, but, you know, as I'm thinking, I'm, there is so much to unpack here. Um, you're sending me to about four or five different books now. Um, you know, just, to, you know, I just want to comment on how, brilliant analysis that is and just uh what a great diving point you you created thank you attorney fields um anyone else yeah we we have brother green put neglect and abandonment yes 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 and and that's exactly what we see thank you brother green and 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 and, and again in this space i'm I want us to appreciate Frederick Douglass's naming this. These are these are literally these are clinical terms: separated, development, affection. These are the words he's using. Separated when I was but an infant. Now, 
this is how they talked, right? This is how they talk now. But we also have to acknowledge, or we have to remember, the brother thought, taught himself. You know, he's all he's, he's basically autodidactic. So, I mean, we might get to the point where you know he he moves from here, he moves from this place. We might we might get to that point, and his uh, slave mistress or uh, whatever you call that woman. Um, taught him some of the rudiments of reading and then you know he did the rest of it but this brother by the time he's you know 20 25 having you know being denied an education taught himself to read and write and um and perhaps you know when i come back again we'll talk about this concept called politicized healing because not only does Frederick Douglass, in my estimation, represent, and, and it's probably, and it's certainly not just Frederick Douglass, it's, it's all of, of our folks who were writing at this time, all of these narratives, Harriet Jacobs, uh, um, what's, what's brother's name? Um, uh, Wells, I, I just can't remember his name, but he, he, he escaped uh, from the, the, the clutches of slavery from St. Louis, Robert Brown Wells uh, escaped from slavery in St. Louis. And so, and, and, then, and then he wrote about his stuff. And, you know, and then we know about 12 years, so we, know about, we know about Harriet Tubman. When we read these narratives, you know, we, we get an opportunity to read about how, how they, we, we get an opportunity to read about slavery through their eyes and, and experiences. And to think that these brothers and sisters had the ability in the midst of this and immediately after this to put this thing into words. And here it is today, we can't get services because we can't explain what we are seeing, feeling and experiencing. is has to be, you know, uh, you know, has to be evidence that the system is working. But when we see here, again, the brother's talking about the impact. He's, talk, he's talking about the systemic destruction of the family structure. That's what he's talking about in this paragraph. This is the common practice. For well, what this separation is done, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection toward his mother and blunt and destroy the natural affection of a mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. And that's what we've seen, right? We'll skip down a bit. I mean, this point here is important. I never saw my mother to know her as, as such more than four or five times in my life. And each of these times was very short in the duration and at night. So his mother was placed on another plantation. And so she risks, she literally risked her life um, every night to go spend a few minutes with her son. Let's see here. Other of, of, of note also, very little communication ever took place between us. Death soon ended what little we could have, what little we could have while she lived. She died when I was about seven years old. So again, that's that's another therein lies another another uh another ace. Let's see. I've had two masters. My first master's name was Anthony. I do not remember his first name. He was generally called Captain Anthony, a title which I presume he acquired by sailing a craft on the Chesapeake Bay. He was not considered a rich slaveholder, 
He owned two or three farms and about 30 slaves. His farms and slaves were under the care of an overseer. The overseer's name Excuse me just a second. The overseer's name was Plummer. Mr. Plummer was a miserable drunkard, a profane swearer, and a savage monster. He always went on with a cow skin and a heavy cudgel. I have known him to cut and slash the women's head so horribly that even master would be enraged at his cruelty and would threaten to whip him if he did not mind himself. And so this is what he's experiencing. And so when we look at the ACEs and the ACEs tell us that, you know, there's community violence. And so we have by seven, he's separated from his mother. He doesn't know who his father is and he's watching daily black folks be beaten. This is the life of Frederick. This, this is the narrative. This is the narrative of his trauma. Master Haber was not a humane, humane slave holder. It required extraordinary barbarity on the part of an overseer to affect him. He was a cruel man, hardened by a long life of slaveholding. He would at times seem to take great pleasure in whipping a slave. So again, he's seeing this. He's reflecting on what he saw you know, in those first seven years of life. I have often been awakened at the dawn of day by the most heart-rendering shrieks of, of an own aunt of mine, whom he used to tie up to a joist and whip upon her naked back till she was literally covered with blood. No words, no tears, no prayers from his gory victim seemed to move his iron heart from his bloody purpose. The louder she screamed, the harder he whipped. And where the blood ran fastest, there he whipped the longest. He would whip her to make her scream and he would whip her to make her hush. And not until overcome by fatigue would he cease to swing the blood clotted cow skin. I remember the first time I ever witnessed this horrible exhibition. Brothers and sisters, he was a child watching his aunt get beat. That is a, that is, this is the onset of this is this is what got me this is this is the onset of the concept of aces this is the onset of of uh, historic trauma this is the onset of ptsd so all of these things that we have words and titles for frederick douglas captured all of these things in 1841 when he wrote his first book when he, first, when he wrote his first narrative. That's what it is. And he gives you very vivid detail. And we know, and so we know that this had an impact on him. I remember the first time I ever witnessed this horrible exhibition. I was quite a child but I well remember it. I should never forget it while I, while, whilst I remember anything. It was, the, it was the first of a long series of such outrages of which I was doomed to be a witness and a participant. So when he says he's a witness and participant, what comes to mind for people? A witness and a participant. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I hope that he did not view his physical inaction as acquiescence. 
But, you know, seeing the abolitionist that he became, I wouldn't be surprised that he did. But at seven, there's very little you can do against, you know, adult males with a full artillery of weapons and a superpower of, you know, barbarianism. So, I mean, but but that's what comes to mind. He, I mean, it appears that he is being, you know, almost self-loathing because we know he did not uh, uh, cheer these floggings on. And, and Attorney Fields, that's what comes to mind for me. And, but I'm of the belief that, like, I, I don't necessarily think he's blaming himself, but I do believe that he's trying to capture you know, the purpose of the, the purpose, you know, the, the enslaver's purpose of public beatings is to create that feeling. The purpose of public beatings was to paralyze the rest. It's, it's the, the public beatings during slavery is the same it's, it's the same thing that we see, uh, really the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's, with, with Derek Chauvin? And so the point, it, a great example. And so the point is to show the subjugated community the inherent power differential. And so he speaks to that in, in, in other book, other parts of the book. And so, the, the, go Dr. ahead. Charles, yes. Can I, can I interrupt here? Absolutely. When I'm, see, this is why I don't like watching certain movies. Mm -hmm. Because it, it brings something out of me that's really not cool. <laughs> you, you know, just to to hear this type of, you know, I, I know that they had what was called the dehumanization process. You have mm -hmm. slave breaking and things of that nature. And just to, to kind of fathom that these people are this, e they're this evil. And it's, and it's on display right now in Palestine and, and in Israel. The, the evil, and I just so I want to go to the panel because <laughs> I, I get I get a little beside myself when I'm hearing things like this. So I want to just kind of get the panel involved. Mm -hmm. and I'm gonna go to uh, we have a I wanted to go to some of the new people that's here, like Brother Green. Brother Green, you you have anything to say or or you have any questions of of Dr. Charles? Uh, I don't have any questions. It, it's a there's a song Ice Cube had back in the early '90s, and he made the statement in the song. He says, "Can you tell me who unleashed our animal instinct?" And that passage that he read takes you back to those moments, mm. to where we lost our idea of humanity and what it means. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, now, who, uh, this brother, UMA, uh, with the title UMA, like I was asking, was that brother Quab or not? Because it kind of favored him. Can you unmute, brother? Whoever. Yeah, that's uh, UMA. Yeah, it should be UAM, but uh, I must have wrote it wrong. Yeah, that's UAM. UAM. You, yeah, you, this, I'm, I'm, forgive me for that. Oh, no problem. You're not United African movement. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I got a I got a question. So what did they say what the what the girl did that he they kept beating down and uh uh whipping her to the you know did, did they say what her supposed it was she supposedly yes. not that she had to do anything? Great question. Great question. Uh here's the answer. This occurrence took place very soon after I went to live with my old master and under the following circumstances. 
This was his aunt. Aunt Hester went out one night where, or for what, I do not know, and happened to be absent when my master desired her presence. He had ordered her not to go out evenings and warned her that she must never let him catch her in the company with a young man who, who was paying attention to her. <laughs> now, skip down. Aunt, Est, Aunt Hester had not only disobeyed his orders and going out, but had been found in company with Lloyd's net, and that's the young man. And so he beat her because she was with her guy and he wanted her for himself. That is Brother Kwabana, isn't it? Yeah, that's Kwabana. Yeah, oh, okay. that's me. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow. That's okay. I mean, wow. I mean, that, that even adds on to more to he was beating her because he was wanted to continue having her as a concubine or whatever. Why? That's his concubine, correct. Correct. Yeah, so, I, I see it it's still, it's still happening today and still affecting us psychologically. I, I think, though, that we need to hear these stories. We need to talk about them. You know, I know my brother just mentioned how it affects hearing these stories. But we need, like you said, analyze them, see how it affects us today because now we're, we're dealing with the same sort of psychological damage from, you know, what we focus on a lot, which is this constant barrage of horrific music where we drop in bombs on each other. Because I will go back and say, okay, this is how they treated us because they dehumanized us. And the word they used started with an N. And now we do it to ourselves and look what we do to ourselves. So, man, this is us. Yeah. Wow. And we get increasingly disconnected, uh, Kwabana, to your point, right? And, and, and so here it is now. He can so graphically describe these things. And today we can't. Other, other, other than, you know, we can drop the M bombs and the bees and all of that, but we can't say how we feel. We are that disconnected hmm. from ourselves and then, and therefore each other, which is why we can treat each other the way that we treat each other. Okay, let me let, uh, me, let me go to Sister Ziza. Sister Ziza. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, no, I don't have anything. Else. I'm listening. To this, uh, you know, I'm digesting it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you, you Senior. All right, uh, what, uh, sister, sister Linda. Oh yes, I'm here, and um, I don't really don't have any questions because this is so interesting to me, and I wanted to see how he was gonna go from perspective of Aces with Frederick Douglass because I, I've I've heard about. Aces a couple of years ago, but mine was from a total different perspective because I adopted a child and there is a black woman, a doctor who talks around the country about Aces and you're probably familiar with her. Um, she was on TED Talks and she was explaining about children who have been adopted and who've gone through foster care. And because when I adopted my child, my first child, because of abandonment, and um, neglect. And so we were trying to figure out what one of the reasons why she was acting out. And somebody told me to start looking into ACEs. And it was just so interesting. So I, I'm listening and I'm learning because I was like, and it's, I'm what you're talking about with Frederick Douglass. And I'm like, you, Quabin, I'm just like, wow, this is heartbreaking for me to even listen to this. But, you know, from the history of it, and I can see I'm, fascinated because you you're you know bringing back from our african history from our history as black people and i'm bringing it today from children today who've been adopted and gone through foster care our own black children today and it's that aces is powerful i'm telling you and you, do you know the, the 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 lady's name is on ted talks a black woman dr um shonda somebody and i'm gonna look it up too but she is the way she explains it and breaks it down with aces, she does not bring it to a historical standpoint like you're doing. That's why I just want to listen and keep learning because this is just so interesting to me. And it's true, every bit of it, what you're saying. Thank you, sister. And um, I, I am a, a veteran of the child welfare system. I've worked in the child wel welfare system for over 20 years. I, I've just... And, um, next 
I, I'll be in the child welfare system until next Thursday. I've resigned um, to do some other things, but I consult with the Department of Children and Family Services in Illinois and um, child welfare is, is modern day human trafficking. And, um, and what we've seen over the past five years, 10 years in the state of Illinois is- uh, Okay, can, can you please repeat what you said? You said the DCF is modern day tra trafficking? It's, it's human trafficking, it's child trafficking, yes. And what, and what we've seen in the state of Illinois over the past 10 years is, so there, there is a group of us who, who work for the state who, if, if again, if we do an overlay with, uh, with what, we, you know, in our context with Frederick Douglass, you know, we, we reasonably be, be considered, you know, the underground, um, you know, and, you know, and then there are some, some, some white folks who you might consider to be abolitionists. But as we fought for, you know, rights for, you know, for our, our youth in care, you know, one by one, folks have been fired or forced to retire. Now, I wasn't either. I, I resigned because we, we were, I, you know, the state just does not deal, they, they don't deal in good faith. Uh, so I was able to leave on my own terms, but I needed to leave nevertheless and find other ways to meet the needs of our children uh, because we have an interesting thing going on here in the state of Illinois in which uh, J.B. Pritzker won't pay for services for our youth and won't pay to uh, reinforce the residential placement centers that can help our youth, but will pay to send our youth to lock facilities out of state. Wow. While at the same time, he's receiving immigrants from Texas by the truckloads, by the busload, and is paying to retrofit facilities in Chicago and elsewhere in the state of Illinois to house those people. Now, I'm not saying those people shouldn't be housed. I'm saying we had homelessness in Chicago before this immigrant crisis started, and we had Black youth. And, and, and now the brown youth in the child welfare system that he was shipping out of the state. And so I don't want to be a part of that. When then we have to find other ways to fight that. And so um, that's, you know, that's kind of how I arrived at that conclusion with regard to my professional life. But I appreciate your, your, your statement, sister, because the, the this is a parallel, you know, child welfare is a, is a good parallel. It's a good uh, corollary to, to what we saw in, um, you know, during our enslavement. And it's a good corollary to, you know, to what is being described by what was being described in the narrative of the trauma of Frederick Douglass. Right, man, that's heavy, brother, that's heavy. I, I've never heard it like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, child trafficking. Okay, uh, I want to go to Brother Melvin Mercer. Brother Melvin Mercer is one of our guests that's going to be on April 3rd. Hopefully you'll be able to make it because the brother is busy. <laughs> brother Mercer, question, comment? Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for contacting me as well, too. I um want to go back to... Um, was the question about uh, where his uh, brother was reading about the doctor was reading about uh, where Frederick Douglass said he participated, and I think I don't know if anyone said it already, but I, just felt, I felt um, I was hearing vicarious trauma. That's what I was saying. So he was experiencing it as he was witnessing it. When he was talking about he participated. It was like his body was participating in it, even though he wasn't the one actually inflicting the pain. Sometimes we could, you know, we could vicarious. We could just feel it. We have a. You know, I know for myself, um, other folks here, when I see someone hurt themselves or I'm watching videos or you know, somebody's falling or something, I can feel it in my, within my body. So it's like my body's participating in Brother what I'm Mercer, watching. Yes. You have a, you have some interference going on right there. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but it's interference. Is it really? Okay. Let's see if I can fix it. That's, that's better right there. That's better? 
that adjustment right there is better. Go okay, ahead. I think my microphone or something. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. But what I was saying was vicarious trauma is what I was talking about, mm -hmm. where you could watch something or, or see something and you could feel it in your body, even though you're not actually doing it. And I was relating it to watching things like we see a lot on the on the internet now. You see people, you know, stuff we never saw back when I was growing up. People hurting themselves and crashing into stuff. You'd hear about it, but you didn't actually see it. And I know as I get older and as a clinician and watching this stuff and reading about it, I could actually feel it. So I watched somebody break their leg or hit their toe or something. I could feel it in my body. And I thought that's what he was saying when he said he was participating um, in the beating of his aunt. I think it was his aunt the brother was reading about. He could feel it in his body. So it was like he was actually involved in it, even though he wasn't perpetrating this on her. I think that's a, I think that too is a, is a great point. And, and with vicarious trauma, um, it, it occurs in the manner that you that you're sharing, brother, uh, brother Mercer. Like, you know, you you can observe it, you can hear about it, right? Um, you can read about it. You know, those you know those things can be sources. You know, those those are exposures, nevertheless. So even though you're not the person actually experiencing it, to witness it, to hear about it, um, you know, or to read it, can be traumatizing. Correct. Yes, and, yes. and those things could be vicarious trauma. Very much so. And, if I can get one more brief example real quick. I'm sorry. Can yeah. you guys hear me okay with no interference? Yep. Okay. Like what they say, like, um, because of my, like they say, blood curdling cries. Mm -hmm. right? So you hear somebody screaming out or you hear, you ain't even seeing it, but you just hear it. And it talks about how your blood will curdle or how your body will react to it. That's what I was hearing as well, too. So, you know, we're around it, but just to hear it, you know, somebody in pain or something like that to your body. And you have has a physical reaction to it. That's what I was hearing when he was talking about participating. So that's what I took from that. Absolutely, brother. So, uh, and, and that's the other piece of this thing that we always have to, you know, be mindful of. Um, we have a neurophysiological response to all of this stuff. That's how we are wired. That's how we're built. It's a safety mechanism. It has an adaptive function, and the adaptive function is to move us towards safety. Right now, what he's what he's what he's de detailing here is the inability to escape it, and so at that point, the stressor the stressor is chronic, and that's what we're getting from Frederick Do Frederick Douglass. Ex excellent point, Brother Mercer. All right, uh, Brother Machenda. Yeah, I'm just taking it all in. Great analysis, great correlation of, uh, you know, and I was going to talk about the parallel, you know, of, you know, what's, what's, what's happening in the world today, you know, in, in my line of work and what I experience in my personal life, what I see as among the, the, the folks that are afflicted. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I'm just uh, yeah, I, I'm just listening, and uh, I'm just I want to hear the, the the other part about you know after the young Frederick Douglass, you know how did he survive this? And, you know Dylan, you know you know of course he had to be resilient to become who he finally became. So how to overcome that? That's like a, I guess a whole nother podcast, huh? Yes, great question, uh, Baba Machina. So the next the the part two of this is going to be about politicized healing. Great question. Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Brother Henry? Uh, yeah, evening. Uh, appreciate the presentation. First of all, before I comment, I want to say something to Brother Machinda. Brother, you know, I think the last Can Baba turn it up a little bit? Okay, I wanted to say something to Brother Machinda. You were correct about the uh about the naming of Africa at that time of two different individuals that uh come to find out I was talking about one and you were talking about the other. So I just want to correct myself on that before I go any further. Unless you guys don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm sure he knows you're talking about the name of Africa and he was talking about the Africanus guy. And then I was talking about a uh historical writer by the same last name, but a different first name. So brother, I just want to correct myself and you were correct. I want to say that before I move on. Uh, uh, 
you know, I dealt with a lot of children in my working career that come close to what you're describing. Uh, and I wholeheartedly agree with you on the human trafficking. It doesn't happen in Illinois, it happened in California too. These people are just pimping these kids for this check. And these kids are going through all kinds of uh, psychological, sexual abuses as they grow up. And then when they grow up, you know, it's like we talked about like a tree without roots and the roots are all messed up. And I kind of, I kind of want to go to what kind of can help somewhat heal them from the experiences that they've been growing up with. And it's a tough battle. Uh, I tried to get mental health services at the school I worked at for about 20 years, could never get nothing going, uh, trying to deal with all the academia stuff. But I know that's a heavy uh, thing that our kids need. But I also experienced that when some of these students, you know, uh, can get kind of rooted in their true history if they learn it at all. It kind of helps out a lot. It doesn't bring them all the way back to where they need to be, but it gives them something to focus on other than what they've been growing up experiencing. And so I don't have the answers to this stuff. I know it's really a bad situation. Like I said, I worked with it for about 20 years and, uh, uh, and I really don't know the story of Frederick Douglass out of all the history that I've studied. I've never really even read a book on him uh, at all, so I don't know. But I want to mention an early brother uh, named David Walker. He wrote something called David Walker's Appeal. I think it was like the 1820s when he wrote that. And so that's the earliest writing I know of someone who had been through the slave experience. And so I'll just leave it at that. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you, brother. Uh, David Walker's appeal is also a, a must read. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, uh, Rock, I, I want to read this last little piece regarding the, this this last the you know his his uh, witnessing of his aunt because it it kind of encapsulates really everybody's comment uh, as to his thoughts on witness and participant. I was so terrified and horror stricken at the sight that I hid myself in a closet and dared not venture out till long after the bloody transaction was over. I expected it would be my turn next. I expected it would be my turn next. It was all new to me. I had never seen anything like it before. I had always lived with my grandmother on the outskirts of the plantation where she was put to raise the children of the younger women. I had therefore been until now out of the way of the bloody scenes that often occurred on a plantation. And so <clears throat> there are, there are numerous aces that he experiences between, you know, from birth until uh, uh, until he ultimately um, flees um, at age 20. You know, I've got to do my math on that to make sure it was 20. I actually think it was a little, little, little younger. But, um, but these are the traumas. Uh, this is a narrative. And, and I think this is how we got to read these things, that this is a narrative of the trauma of, of Frederick Douglass. You know, when we read... Uh, um, Harriet Jacobs' book, we got to read it as a narrative of her trauma. When we read Harriet Tubman, we have to read it as a narrative of her trauma. When we read David Walker, uh, we have to read it as an, a, a narrative of his trauma. Um, it, it, if we read it, the, the, the reason we have to do it that way is because uh, I think in the terms of the question, like how do, how do we get through this? 
us reading it with a trauma lens is a part of politicized healing. And it helps us to better recognize and appreciate what they were doing when they put their experience to words. And even today in these spaces, um, there is a lot of work being done with traumatized youth and adults around narrative um, interventions about how you take control of the narrative. And so this is another one of those examples of we have no idea what we say, right? <laughs> and so we talk about the parable all the time, you know, um, what is it, until the, until the lion, until the lion writes the, writes the story, the hunter will always win, whatever that thing is. That's what this is. That's what this is. That's what narrative therapy is. It gives the, it gives the victim, it gives the subjugated person voice. And so that's step one in this process. That's, that's really what politicized healing is about. And as I said, when I, Come back next time when, when Bob invites me back next time. We'll talk about politicized healing, but that's step one. It ain't it ain't about writing a book. It's about creating your narrative and being able to, um, in a safe way, revisit the trauma. Do what is called clinically a sequence analysis. And, and just as we're trying to figure out what Frederick meant between victim and participant, help the client, you know, help the affected, help that person, you know, posit themselves in the narrative in a correct manner. So they're not blaming themselves for the trauma that they, that they experience. But that requires, you know, what we call a holding environment. We gotta, we gotta have our people in a safe space to, to do this kind of work. And so um, <clears throat> I had, I, I've, I've read this, I've, I've read this book. I've read this book in the past two weeks, four times. Um, and, and I'd read it at least two times prior, but once I decided that this is what I was going to do tonight. Um, it's just necessary that I continue to revisit the text. And I also think uh, this is what it means for us to commune with the ancestors. What? This stuff is written. This, this stuff is written. We, we have to commune with the ancestors. I'm sorry about but Go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, what's the name of the book? Uh, so this book is The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Okay. And so this is, his, this is the first book. So he's got three. He's got three biographies. And so this is this is the first one. The narrative, what? The narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Okay. And so but that that was really that was just chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> or chapter one, maybe chapter two, that, uh, no, actually that was all, that was just chapter one that we were talking about. And that, and that, that proved to be, you know, a handful. And so, uh, we cannot underestimate or underappreciate, um, what our, ancestors went through and um and, and we we have to kind of reconfigure some things i mean this is really an awesome book a lot of the things that we contemplate and a lot of things that um you know we probably say some disrespectful things about uh so so i'll give you one so <clears throat> and, and, and brother you tell me when we're wrapping up because I, I know we we over uh, but just just a couple of points. Go ahead. After your points, we'll wrap up. And then I want to end with uh, Attorney Larry Fields. OK, uh, so we say, you know, we attribute this quote to Harriet Tubman. Um, I free, you know, however many slaves and I would have freed more if they'd have known they were slaves. Well, 
first of all, I've never been able to find that quote from her. And folks that I've read that are considered scholars on her haven't been able to find that quote. Um, and myself, I wrote about Harriet Tubman every year from third grade to my freshman year in, um, in college and never saw that quote. Uh, so I don't know that that ever really exists. Now, it could, but that's just one of the myths about Harriet Tubman. But the reason I bring that quote up is because Frederick Douglass even addresses that. When he's talking about, when he's contemplating There are many reasons why people wouldn't flee. One was where we gonna go. Two was what happens if we get caught. And three, I don't wanna leave my people. He's very clear about that, that that kept a lot of people on the plantation. Now, certainly there was some sellouts and, um, and yeah, I mean, you know, there, there was some sellouts, but this was not a situation where these people did not know that they were being subjugated. So if we really think about it, hard for me to imagine that Harriet Tubman would even say such a thing. But this, this too just happens to be one of the things that Frederick Douglass captures in his initial book. And so that, that's my final take on the book as it stands right now. And when I come back, whenever brother have me back, we're going to use the book again to talk about um, politicized healing. All right, brother, thank you. Appreciate it, Dr. Charles, as usual. Excellent, excellent analysis. And that's definitely okay. a book that we should all can I, can I just ask one question before we get off? Yes, go ahead. I want to ask him because I remember her name was Dr. Nadine Burke. Are you familiar with her? Not right offhand, but I, I kind of remember seeing a, a TED talk on ACES. So I'm sure I've seen it. Yeah. But I'll revisit it. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thanks for that, Linda. Yeah, yeah. something from Attorney Fields. Attorney Fields. Yes. Appreciate you yeah. coming this evening. And I'm, I want to show your YouTube channel. And I just want you to give us a little history on the Level Set show. Well, thank you. Um, the Level Set uh, started out with um, Reddit Hudson and I. Um, Reddit is a gentleman that formerly worked for the ACLU and the Urban League. He is a, um, a, a civil justice reform advocate. He worked as a police officer, worked in an internal affairs and <clears throat> Also happened to be a Division One basketball player for SLU. That was a little bit before his time, and we, you know, in St. Louis at Ground Zero with respect to the Ferguson uprising, um, put a show together, and we started having guest speakers and so forth. Uh, and lo and behold, we ran in, into I ran Welcome into my um, my good. Uh, Good buddy from Morehouse. Uh, at at one point, uh, Dr. Alexander, and the rest has been history. Um, so we get together every week for at least an hour, and we talk about these topics. But we try and do a deep dive on them. Uh, as you can see, the level of uh, commitment and research and analysis that we all are forced to engage in as a result of being at the table with Dr. Alexander. And we also have attorney Gerald Christmas, who is uniquely positioned. Um, he worked in inside of the, the Senate when, um, when Claire from Missouri was there. Uh, and he's done, he's just an incredible uh, civil rights attorney, criminal attorney. Uh, and Mike Jones, which is an individual that is worth his weight in gold as a political strategist. Um, so, you know, we do a deep dive into a number of issues ranging, you know, uh, all of them are for the betterment of our community. And as you can see from this evening, that's just typical 
Dr. Alexander. We don't take it for granted, um, but those insights are priceless. And as you can see, you know, it, he he articulated it today. But what is part of his DNA, and part of our DNA, is to commune with the ancestors. Um, I can't think of any shows when. You know, uh, we've talked about a topic, and at some point, Dr. Alexander didn't say this isn't new uh, <laughs> and, and can reflect on a number of things. And that is a common theme. We did a deep dive at uh, the ins insistence of Dr. Alexander's research on the Colored Convention about a month ago or six weeks ago. Um, and I had, you know, vague. Uh, exposure to them, but Dr. Alexander presented a presentation that not only the color convention um, spoke about things that are still at the forefront today in 1840, an organization that was founded based on the riots, you know, uh, white envy in Cincinnati. Um, running 1,000 free African-Americans or Blacks out of Cincinnati that were well-to-do. They had to flee to Canada in, 19, in, 18, in the 1830s. And the Colored Convention um, you know, it began as genesis at that point. Um, but go all the way up to, you know, 19, you know, the, the 20, 20th century, they're the ones that charged, uh, uh, we claim, genocide in front of the UN. I saw that referenced um, a couple of times over the weekend for the first time. You know, people had the, uh, were referencing the actual charge of we charge genocide. You know, my point is, is that we've got to do, there, there really isn't uh, a look back, you know, with respect to us because it's all one thing. You know, we, we can, we look back to find out where, you know, how we got to where we are but it's all so relevant. I mean, it seems like it's all, you know, that, that movie that won an Oscar that nobody understood, every, everything all at once really appears to be what's happening for us because all of those things from Frederick Douglass, who was also a member of the Color Convention, uh, you know, Martin Delaney and all of those guys, all of their work is more prevalent today than it was back in Antebellum. So... Uh, you know, that gives you an idea and I, you know, I, you keep doing what you, what you're doing. If there's anything we can do to, uh, further the tentacles of, of, of your influence, we certainly will help. Uh, and, uh, thank you for having me today. Oh, thank and, you for coming, man. Thank it. you for those kind words, Attorney Fields. Yeah. Oh, well, look at that. Somebody uh, record that for me. <laughs> <laughs> I need the tape now. Well, well, excellent, man. I'm I'm glad I met you, brothers, man, because I'm I'm really enjoying your 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 show. But well, uh, thank you. Now, Kwabana, brother Kwabana. Hey, brother. You had you have put something in the chat. You want to tell us about that right now before we get out of here? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I just heard the brothers mention about uh, the name Africa, and I guess they were talking about Scipio and Leon, the other Africanist names. And it, ironically, I just saw a post that came up from Renoko Rashidi since we just did that piece on him last weekend, and where he addressed, he addresses so many times of uh, the names of uh, Africa and people questioning the name of Africa. So I just shared that in the chat where he talked about... Um, the names of Scipio Africanus, the Roman general uh, who engineered the defeat of the African nation called Carthage, and also Leo Africanus. And again, Africa is not named after the Roman general Scipio, nor is it named after Leo Africanus, a man who comes much later. He said, these are myths, and I repeat that these are myths. And so I just wanted to share that and how he shared his, uh, he, he named the guy, that's where he was from. That's where he got, that's where they put the Africa on, on the last name, so. Not they didn't name it after him, so I just shared that because again, Renoko would constantly have to point that out. Right on. That's on the chat, everybody. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm aware of all the names that was called down through the different ages. Uh, you with uh, without Kibulan being the oldest, and uh, that 
at one time they called the whole continent Ethiopia, down in South Africa, Manitoba, to Mary, Sias, and Egypt, and all of that. So, yeah. Uh, let me just say this in terms of dealing with this psychological trauma thing. Um, and me, myself, I like to study those those rebellious warriors that was out in the bush and and those being some of the examples that we may try to use i know it's kind of scary but like Thessalon, Kristoff, you know the mau mau uh brother around in the angola area called mochis and these type of brother and sisters also and what they did to alleviate that uh, foot of the European on their lives. So uh, that's another story in itself. But like I say all the time, you know, we are behind enemy lines and we need to recognize that. And, uh, you know, when you're behind enemy lines, you got to result to other things. You remember what Malcolm said about, about, a, a, about a gorilla, all he needs is a rifle and a pair of tennis shoes you know, to get it done. Um, but anyway, it's, 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 uh, it's a tough situation. And then, you know, when you even go down that road, you got to worry about the ones that's in your camp, you know, dropping dimes and, you know, on you and whatnot about what you're trying to do. Uh, and like I say, we need to, you know, we need more planning and less ceremony about where we're trying to go. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Let me see. Am I on mute? Am I on mute? No, I'm not on mute. Okay, people, I'm I'm just uh elated that we had all the the people show up this evening. Uh we had <laughs> for the first time attorney Larry Fields, brother Melvin Mercer came and then we we uh also ask a few other people to come and brother green showed up so it, it, it's a real good thing to have people show up with their personal time and share this this great information and and we and we really need it and we really need to know what happened and so we can moving forward we'll be able to make some adjustments and do some things that we need to do to to better the situation that we're in so next week, we have Brother Damian McCalman coming on, that's shown on the screen. And he's going to do a part two of this youth, youth development, gaining the, their trust and admiration, which is directly tied into what we were talking about tonight. You know, even though we, these children, and, and a lot of us have, you know, the these traumas, we, we can change the situation. So... We, we're also looking at solutions. So it's just, uh, everybody, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And we're going to take our pause. Each one, teach one. In Conscious Corner, everybody have a good evening.